This channel is part of the History Hit Network. The world is changed forever by a new technology, nuclear. Two superpowers dominate the world, each facing the other in a state of neither war nor peace. This is the story of the Cold War, how the push of one button could lead to total global destruction. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. How the struggle between two political systems caused millions to suffer. Spying was very much part of the Cold War. And how a world was created which lived in constant fear. Mad World. Mutually Assured Destruction. This time on Mad World, both sides are close to turning the world into a wasteland. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. He said, all I could think about is you and your sister and your mother were going to be vapor. We all came to grips and it was truly the end of the world as we knew it. A proxy war spins out of control on the battlefield and at home. It is an orchestrated lie to make the American people hate the Vietnamese. To... The American troops would be impaled on those sharp bamboos in trying to avoid the dummy Viet Cong. I witnessed the, the tragedy and the waste of war as well. You don't wish it on anybody. Both superpowers make moves to extend their control. For the people of Prague, it must have felt like being the nut in a nutcracker. Our two peoples tonight hold the future of the world in our hands. And the USA steps foot on alien ground. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. Gerald Kennedy, you solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. So help me God. January 1961. Jack Kennedy is the youngest man to become President of the United States. He has a fresh approach to the tension between East and West. We offer not a pledge but a request that both sides begin anew the quest for peace. Before the dark powers of destruction engulf all humanity in planned or accidental self-destruction. In Vienna, Kennedy organizes a private meeting with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. <laughs> господин федеральный президент поблагодарить вас за теплую встречу за добрые слова в адрес советского союза нашего народа history hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans our goal is to bring you award-winning documentaries that cover the events and figures that have shaped our world all in one place travel with us to the fascinating world of prehistoric scotland or uncover the lives of the people who called pompeii home we also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network sign up now for a free trial and timeline fans get 50 percent of their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. Ninety miles from Florida, Castro's Cuba finally provoked the United States to quarantine the island. Aerial films revealed the presence on Cuban soil of offensive Russian nuclear weapons. Here you had a Soviet outpost with nuclear missiles 90 miles from the US. The Cold War comes to America's backyard. I was born in Banis, which is a small sugar town on the eastern edge of Cuba. When the Americans went to the UN with proof of the missile, 
miles, many of those photographs were of areas near Banis. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. It was a reckless gamble to which President Kennedy reacted swiftly. He ordered the fleet to turn back or seize ships attempting to augment this aggressive buildup. Many of the missiles were supposedly driven under cover and so on, but these are huge bloody things, so clearly everyone knew that something was going on. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the most chilling episode so far of the Cold War. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. And I clearly remember standing at the beach with my parents, and you could see in the distance, in the horizon, gray ships that were American battle cruisers. That's how close it came. At every air base in the United States, planes of every type are ready to retaliate against any aggression. Despite Kennedy's warning, Russian Premier Khrushchev continues to ship missiles across the Atlantic with the full support of Cuba's leader. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to haul and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and to join in a historic effort to end the perilous arms race and to transform the history of man. He has an opportunity now to move the world back from the abyss of destruction. No one knows at the time, but just off the coast, a heated argument kicks off. Three Soviet submariners have to make a terrible decision. A US destroyer dropped a depth charge in the vicinity of a Russian submarine. It knocked out the communications of that submarine with Moscow. The protocol that applied at the time for the Russian commander was to use the nuclear tipped weapon he had on board, the assumption being that if he'd been hurt by enemy action, there must be a war on. So he had the hard decision to make as to what to actually do. The captain's name is Savitsky. Soviet nuclear protocol dictates three senior officers must vote unanimously to launch the nuclear missile. The second in command votes against his captain and by a two-to-one vote, World War III, I guess, was averted. The story of a man who saved the world is not revealed until 1998. His name was Vasily Alexandrovich Arkhipov. An emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council is called. Do you Ambassador Zorin deny that the USSR has placed and is placing missiles and sites in Cuba. Don't wait for the translation, yes or no. But diplomacy is quickly overridden by secrecy and frustration. You have denied that they exist. I want to know if you, if this, if I've understood you correctly. Uh, I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. As talks break down, nuclear war looks imminent. Command center was there at Redstone. In those days, there was a bunker in Southern Appalachians. Dad went away for two or three weeks. He said, we, we had the codes, and we were waiting for the order to fire, and there was not a single one of us that weren't convinced that this was going to happen, since we were literally within minutes of pushing the button. He said, all I could think about is you and your sister and your mother were going to be vapor. We all came to grips that it was truly the end of the world as we knew it. And it, it was maybe 20 years later okay, before he would even talk about it. Khrushchev refuses to budge. His missiles are in Cuba 
in response to a threat from the USA. American nuclear warheads are in Turkey, right next to the Soviet border. The issue which confronts the Security Council is grave. The hopes of mankind are concentrated in this room. Frantic talk between both sides continues. Protests seethe on the streets of the West. The outcome is finally determined by one-on-one -on -one talks between Premier Khrushchev and President Kennedy. There is historical evidence of Castro riding to Moscow and urging them to fire the missiles and, in effect, starting a nuclear war. He's bonkers. I'm telling you, he's absolutely bonkers. <laughs> and the deal which Khrushchev wanted to make if he was to agree not to put missiles to Cuba was for the Americans to move their missiles from Turkey. It was not in the Americans' interest to embarrass the Soviets too much. Kennedy reacted correctly to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Had he not addressed it the way he addressed it, uh, quite frankly, against a lot of the military and civil leadership, you know, we may well have had the first nuclear war. And the first nuclear war may well have been the last one. Because once it starts, don't know that you can contain it. The retreat to Moscow. Russian ships steam out from Cuban ports with their decks loaded with missiles the Soviets are withdrawing under pressure from the New World. The story put out in the press is that Khrushchev has capitulated. U.S. planes and picket ships have counted 42 rockets on Russian-bound ships. Kennedy has given some ground, too. U.S. missiles are quietly removed from Turkish soil. They finally uh, cut a deal that, you know, you get the, uh, the nuclear weapons uh, out of uh, Cuba and quit trying to expand communism in the Western Hemisphere, then we'll uh, take our intermediate-range nuclear weapons out of uh, Turkey and and we'll all get along for at least for a while. Both sides save face. History's most dangerous game of poker is over. This year we were saluting not only the glorious dead of two world wars, but giving thanks that the world had drawn back from the brink of disaster over Cuba. In a small country almost no one has heard of, civil war breaks out. It is about 4,800 miles away from Moscow and almost 9,000 miles from Washington, D.C. America began her aid program, bringing equipment, weapons, and experience to boast of the South. The Russians and the Chinese gave their support to the North. Vietnam, August 1964. The people here have already been fighting for 20 years. First, against the Japanese occupation, then against French colonial rule, now against each other. This year, the Viet Cong struck in larger groups than ever before. When government forces flushed a large communist group, the guerrillas drifted into the jungle to regroup. I was born uh, in the north before Vietnam was divided into two parts. And my parents took us south because they witnessed the cruelty and atrocities. And I grew up in the South. Went to, went to school, medical school, graduated, joined the army. The communist Viet Cong are close to winning the war. They have made hit and run raids within four miles of Saigon, center of US and South Vietnam operations. Both sides were poor countries, no weapon production. So both sides relied heavily on their allies, the South, the American mostly, and the North communist, Red China, 
and the Soviet Union at the time. American troops are not directly involved in the fighting, but American warships hover off the coast. We do not want Southeast Asia to fall under communist domination. If South Vietnam succumbs to the North, America thought it may have a domino effect, the first country to fall in a communist expansion across Asia and beyond. Then, a tiny incident in the South China Sea lights a flame. Reports have been received of a nighttime incident in the Gulf of Tonkin. We had these boats that we detected on radar, and then uh, we picked them up visually. They're approaching from our starboard quarter. We opened fire. They launched their torpedoes. The Gulf of Tonkin incident is billed as the first direct attack by the North Vietnamese on the US military. A U.S. aircraft carrier is not far from the Maddox. Robert McNamara, U.S. Secretary of Defense, briefs the press. They were reporting they were avoiding torpedoes and that they had sunk one of the attacking patrol craft. No pictures of the attack are released, and the U.S. warships are undamaged. In view of the unprovoked attacks, the deliberate attacks in international waters on U.S. naval forces, the United States has taken the precaution of moving substantial military reinforcements to Southeast Asia. Questions hang in the air about the Gulf of Tonkin attack. But the USA finally has a reason to turn its might on the North Vietnamese. At sea, on land, and in the air, the awesome United States military machine is mounting a force that can face up to any threat. The USA is now in the front line of the Vietnam War. From its four and a half acre flight deck, the American carrier Enterprise can unleash more destructive power than the combined airstrikes of World War II. When they decided to send troops to Vietnam, it was a very, very bad move. Uh, because that kind of gave the communists a good, just reason. Because there are foreigners there in South Vietnam. Once the war started, and you know, the weapon kept on rolling in by both sides. We are in Southeast Asia to help our friends preserve their own opportunity to be free of imported terror, of alien assassination managed by the North Vietnam communists. American troops wait to advance on Viet Cong positions while Sky Raiders prepare the way with their terrifying napalm bombs. This is the hot spot in the Cold War, and this year saw it getting hotter. Whereas the American, because they rely so heavily on their superior firepower, they'll go into battle in the jungle like going into a big picnic. Yeah, they made a lot of noises. The enemy can, can smell their aftershave and their Salem cigarette miles away and, and avoid clashes. American casualties quickly rise. This sergeant was later to die from his wounds because medical helicopters couldn't get through. The Americans can no longer afford to underestimate the power and skill of the Viet Cong. The cost of this conflict is a nightmare balance sheet in lives and money. It's costing America at least a thousand million dollars every month. At least 170,000 Viet Cong have been killed and nearly 7,000 Americans. President Johnson is called to account. Find an answer to their problem there.
believe last week they had the second largest week of casualties that the enemy has ever suffered out there. Wounded are in excess of that. They're, they're, they're dead. Body counts in excess of 10,000. They're wounded is something we estimate more than three times that much, and they lose most of their wounded, and we lose less than one percent of ours. But the greatest death rate is among ordinary farmers and villagers. Meanwhile, Vietnamese civilians walk hopelessly away from their burning homes. Innocent victims of a dispute too complex for many of them to understand. And of course, I, mean, you know, I witnessed the, the tragedy and the waste of war as well. And you don't wish it on anybody. During the war, collateral damages is always there. You can't avoid hurting civilians. The peasants, the farmers, they are victims of the war. They have nowhere to, to hide, nowhere to run. The people of North Vietnam are now fiercely anti-American. They are enlisted to help the Viet Cong. As well as rice, the peasants plant a less palatable crop. The American troops would be impaled on those sharp bamboos in trying to avoid the dummy Viet Cong. Schooling, says the commentator, has to be confined to the night time to avoid the air raids by day. It's hard for the children, the Russian commentary continues, but the day will come when their country will be free and happy. Future president Richard Nixon does not believe the determination of the North Vietnamese is a serious threat. We should assume that the war could last uh, two, three, or four years. Hopeful and hoping, of course, that by applying more power, we could reduce that below two years. Then, American confidence is blown away. The New Year Festival of Tet is the biggest holiday in Vietnam, celebrated with flowers and food. The Tet, which is Vietnamese New Year, is very, very sacred occasion in, in the Vietnamese culture. So there was a ceasefire agreed, agreed on by both sides, but they deliberately violated that. But in 1968, the Tet holiday is anything but peaceful. A bloody battle rages in the center of Saigon. The Viet Cong offensive throughout South Vietnam struck at the very heart of the Allied command. It also brought home to all Americans the suicidal determination of their opponents, their ability to infiltrate and conduct a devastating guerrilla campaign. I was brought down to Saigon to be the deputy commanding officer of the American Forces Radio and TV Network. Uh, was my day job. Uh, my night job was special operations, uh, clandestine work. I thought the uh, North Vietnamese were very uh, disciplined, very hardcore, willing to sacrifice uh, hundreds of thousands of their youth to the idea of reunifying Vietnam. The South Vietnamese were very lovely people. Uh, they were very uh, hard fighters once they were trained and given the proper weapons, and very uh, much uh, wanting to be their own country and, and not dominated by China. 80,000 North Vietnamese troops strike all over the South. But Tet proves a severe blow to the North's hopes. Over 45,000 soldiers are killed. However, it shows that America is not winning. It is a great political victory for the North. Once again, the plight of the civilian is heartrending. But sympathy is tempered by suspicion. Many thousands of so-called refugees have been arrested on grounds of assisting the communist cause. Death toll of this fearful week of fighting is to be killed. Allied military losses number nearly 1,500.
the USA wakes up to the fact that Vietnam is not going to be an easy war to win. January 1968. One country in Eastern Europe is about to push back against the restrictions behind the Iron Curtain. I was a little kid. I lived in the Prague suburbs, and I was from a typical family. It was very commanded, very state-controlled, and was centrally planned uh, economy. We had a duty to work. If you didn't work for more than three months, you could go to prison for being a parasite of, uh, of the society. My parents were not uh, communists. Czechoslovakia has a new party leader with new ideas. Alexander Dubček has challenged hardline communism and won. He puts his reforms into action, a freer market, freedom of movement and steps towards a multi-party government. For the people of Prague, it must have felt like being the nut in a nutcracker. To the west, East Germany, to the north, Poland, to the east, Russia herself. A pincer grip of traditional Soviet communism which could shatter all hopes of a more enlightened socialism. The Russians are not happy. Dubček is summoned to the Politburo in Moscow. There is going to be this head-on tussle in the Politburo meeting with Mr. Dubček. Is it possible that one outcome of it could be Mr. Dubček's resignation, do you think? Mr. Dubček is a very sincere and honest man. If he promises something, he, he keeps his word. The hopes of the Czech people rest on Dubček's shoulders. He calls his program socialism with a human face. The West call it the Prague Spring. But the Russian noose is already tightening. Huge armies gather on the Czech border. The reform that causes the greatest friction is freedom of the press. In China, behind a complete security screen, the Russians had restated their demands that the reforming element in the Czech cabinet should be forcibly removed that censorship of the press should be restored. But just supposing the Russian pressure from the Politburo is so great that Mr. Dubček does give in and say to them, OK, we will have censorship back. What then would be the reaction of Czech journalists? Now, after more than seven months of free press, of, uh, they, they would like to go back to the old times where uh, when they weren't able to express their, their own views. Europe holds its breath, aware of lessons from recent history. It was this same intransigent attitude which caused the Hungarians to revolt in 1956. No one wants the bloodshed in Hungary repeated in Czechoslovakia. Millions of people throughout the communist bloc are desperately trying to persuade the Soviets that it is possible to live by democratic principles and be a good communist as well. The Prague Spring lasts eight months. Suddenly we saw tanks at the end of the street and we were very excited about it, the shouting tanks, tanks, and we were running our tricycles close to the tanks. Z paměti mě určitě už nevyšumí vzpomínka, kdy nás maminka vlastně na 20. srpna ještě za tmy budila se slovy, že začala třetí světová válka s pláčem, slzy v očích a tím nás budila. 
Overnight, 2,000 tanks and 200,000 troops invade. Russian, Polish, and Hungarian troops carry out their cold-blooded occupation of Czechoslovakia. With repeated appeals for calm from the Czech authorities, the mood of the people was grim and hostile. from the building, identification numbers, like, which is red and blue. People are supposed to take down the numbers, the names of the streets and numbers to confuse uh, the occupants. Demonstrators carried a flag stained by the blood of a patriot in a growing wave of protest. There's been protest all over the world at Russia's brutal act. Resistance, futile though everyone knows it to be, continues. Burning vehicles are pushed into tanks and trucks to set them on fire. Crowds jeer and argue with the blank, uncomprehending faces of the troops they thought were their allies. But defiance is crushed under the tracks of the Russian tanks. The Soviets claim they have a right to invade under the Brezhnev Doctrine, the right to intervene if any Iron Curtain country moves towards capitalism. Tempers flare and the Russians start shooting. A nation that has grasped freedom now has it snatched away by naked force. 72 Czechs and Slovaks are killed. I have a feeling that the people of the world were very quickly, very quickly, practically, for two years. For two years, it was in the wide public opinion. Dubček is ousted, and his reforms are reversed. The Prague Spring is over. Czechoslovakia begins a 20-year stretch of hardline Soviet rule. Communist forces seem to be gaining ground on many fronts, but the USA is about to score a major Cold War victory. The space race. So far, it's 3-0 to the USSR who have managed to put the first satellite, the first animal, and then the first human into space. The USA is striving for the first man on the moon, but the journey has its ups and downs. And spacemen of tomorrow, together with life science editor Warren Young, get a taste of the world of weightlessness. Each zero-gravity run lasts for only 15 seconds, but those who have experienced it say that in no gravity, time seems to stretch out, and you gradually do learn to navigate. At impact, the capsule did not right itself, as I had expected it to. But I had an hour to wait for recovery. I inflated the raft and climbed in. The raft was upside down, however. I saw four or five airplanes circling the area. The next thing I heard was a man calling to me from the water behind the raft. <laughs> I offered them some food, but they had just had lunch and weren't hungry. The space-suited commander about to wait in the capsule at the top of the Redstone rocket. As the rocket soared, 
cameras inside the capsule recorded Shepard's reactions. The rocket reached over 5,000 miles an hour and a height of 115 miles. The space race had as much and perhaps even more to do with missile superiority than placing you know, people on the moon. That's, uh, the exploration side of it was exciting. But there is absolutely no question that the massive effort was being put in the development of strategic missiles and the weapon systems on those strategic missiles. In four weeks' time, astronauts Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins will attempt the three-day journey to the moon. The journey of the astronauts is more than a technical achievement. It is a reaching out of the human spirit. What could bring home to us more the limitations of the human scale than the hauntingly beautiful picture of our Earth seen from the moon? When the first man stands on the moon, every American will stand taller because of what he has done. On July 20th, 1969, two members of the human race set foot on a rock in outer space. Uh, Neil and Buzz, uh, the President of the United States is in his office now and would like to say a few words to you, over. That would be an honor. Uh, go ahead, Mr. President, this is Houston out. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. I just can't tell you how proud we all are. For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. And as you talk to us from the sea of tranquility, it inspires us to redouble our efforts to bring peace and tranquility to Earth. And I knew a lot of these guys. You know, I grew up with them. I mean, it takes a special kind of person to uh, place oneself uh, in harm's way in that manner. And all of them did it, whether they were cosmonauts or astronauts. Heroes. And now, the first man to set foot on the moon, Neil Armstrong. The strategic importance of the United States being the first to put a person on the moon, I truly believe cannot be understated how important that was. The USA is finally ahead in the race to explore space. It is a landmark in human endeavor. It is also a foothold into the future battleground of the Cold War. The United States has been fighting the Vietnamese people longer than anyone else in its entire history. September 1969, the United Nations. Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko replies to President Nixon's latest request for peace talks. We pride ourselves on the fact that the Soviet Union's assistance is multiplying the capabilities of free Vietnam in its arduous and heroic struggle. The war in Vietnam has been unremitting for four years. On the political settlement of the Vietnam problem are presently underway in Paris. To think that the United States can obtain at the conference table what it failed to achieve with a half million strong army on the battlefield would mean to be obviously at variance with reality. More talks were held in Paris with the North Vietnamese, but the dialogue was hardly meaningful. It appeared as if the only thing each side was prepared to accept was the virtual surrender of the other. If there was no superpower involved on both sides, perhaps if there is any wise on a small scale. Talks are not making any progress, and neither is the war on the ground. 
in a similar position to this to the south. We were two weeks almost in the same position. Just couldn't go. Maybe it took five or six hundred casualties before we even gained an inch. We really only have two choices open to us if we want to end this war. I can order an immediate precipitate withdrawal of all Americans from Vietnam without regard to the effects of that action. Or we can persist in our search for a just peace. Hopes for a breakthrough rest with the new president of the USA, Richard Milhouse Nixon. Mr. Prime Minister, our two peoples tonight hold the future of the world in our hands. Nixon's definition of a just peace requires the North to allow South Vietnam to remain free of communism. He believes there is only one way to get that commitment. I ordered the bombing of North Vietnam and the mining of Haiphong. Three bombers dropped 60 tons of high explosive. It arrived simultaneously in an area one kilometer wide and two kilometers long. It sounds irrational to me that in a free society, the President of the United States would sit in a room alone and make a decision that might bring on World War III without so much as even consulting the leaders or the members of the Congress of the United States. It is not the easy way. It is the right way. It is a plan which will end the war and serve the cause of peace, not just in Vietnam, but in the Pacific and in the world. During the period from December 26 to January 1st, U.S. Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps air crews flew more than 650 tactical airstrikes, and the Air Force flew 126 B-52 missions against military targets in North Vietnam. The North Vietnamese are no longer fighting as guerrillas. The North Vietnamese now are in divisional strength. They're on the highways, packed with trucks and personnel carriers. They are a logical target. And there are some 48 targets right now that are not covered by aerial protection that B-52s could wipe out. But the B-52s are also wiping out non-military targets. Troops taken prisoner are shown the horror of their work. Since uh, being captured and being a prisoner, I have seen uh, uh -huh. some uh, areas that were bombed that were non-military targets. Mm -hmm. For example? A hospital and a school. The bombings stir up protests worldwide. That the allegations of atrocities committed in Vietnam are hurting our worldwide reputation. But perhaps what is even more important than our image in the world is the conscience of the American people. This conscience is powerfully expressed by university students across the nation. Our intent was to make as clear as we could to the president that the present disturbance on campuses was not a minor issue. Uh, we've issued uh, an, an official call of the National Supervisory Board of the National Student Association calling for a nationwide student strike. I think the government was worried about them in the sense that they, uh, I don't know that uh, they felt the politics uh, of them were so uh, threatening, but I think people uh, feared uh, riots and things that would happen. I know a young fellow that uh, worked in the unit that um, I was assigned to in Washington uh, had came around a corner and it was a big riot and they took him out of his car and turned his car over or burned it and, and I remember we all chipped in to buy him a new car. Now I understand that there has been and continues to be opposition to the war in Vietnam on the campuses and also in the nation. Under no circumstances will I be affected whatever by it. It was a crazy time. Uh, the country was torn apart by uh, how people felt about Vietnam. I can recall a group of students, probably 500 or 1,000, 
were going to go trash what was called the Cooley Labs at the University of Michigan. And uh, the Cooley Lab had an atomic reactor in it. You, you know, you can't have students going in tearing up a, a lab with a, with a reactor. Tension across the USA is high. Then, students are killed. Kent State University, May the 4th, 1970. The National Guard opens fire on a protest. They fire 67 rounds. Nine students are wounded. One is paralyzed for life. Four of them die. When you do have a situation of a crowd throwing rocks and the National Guard is caused it, called in, that there is always the chance that it will escalate into the kind of a tragedy that happened at Kent State. Jeffrey Miller, age 20. Allison Krauss, age 19. William Schroeder, age 19. And Sandra Shore, age 20. Two of the students killed were not even involved in the protest. I saw the pictures of those four youngsters in the Evening Star the day after that tragedy. And I vowed then that we were going to find methods that would be more effective to deal with these problems of violence. The Kent State University shootings were uh, a real uh, problem with uh, the, uh, the forces in Vietnam uh, to the degree that uh, the uh, GIs thought that the American people were against the war and it was very disheartening to them and led to very low morale and to drug use and to other problems. The Vietnam War is radicalizing young people. Too many have died already. Too many from Massachusetts, too many from your states, too many of our young men and too many of theirs. Too many children and too many aged. The time to end the war is now. We must carry that message to every corner of the land. In the chaos, President Nixon brings down U.S. involvement in the war. I have decided to reduce the authorized troop ceiling in Vietnam to 484,000 by December 15. In Vietnam itself, 1970 saw the continuation of the American troop withdrawal and an increasingly important role being assigned to South Vietnam's own army. Under the newly authorized troop ceiling, a minimum of 60,000 troops will have been withdrawn from Vietnam by December 15. American military leadership, much of it from here at West Point has been superb. I am grateful that only a small number of this class has orders for Vietnam. The mass bombings and international protests continue for three more years. There seems to be no end to the madness. All of the senators, uh, hardly without exception, and I know of no exceptions, have been trying to get information. Why the bombing? Why the massive bombing? It is an orchestrated lie, orchestrated by the Pentagon, to make the American people hate the Vietnamese. We're here representing a newly formed American anti-war movement organization called the Indochina Peace Campaign, with the immediate focus of putting pressure on the Nixon administration to sign the Nine Point Peace Agreement. In more than 30 years of sound and fury, more than 3 million dead, wounded or missing. 56,000 dead Americans, 500 Australians, 188,000 South Vietnamese, 900,000 North Vietnamese, 2 million dead and wounded non-combatant civilians. Finally, in January 1973, peace talks reach a conclusion. At 12.30 Paris time today, January 23, 1973, 
The agreement on ending the war and restoring peace in Vietnam was initialed by Dr. Henry Kissinger on behalf of the United States and Special Advisor Lee Duc Tho on behalf of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. This is the American Forces Vietnam Network. Well, there it is, what the world has been waiting for, an agreement to end the fighting in Vietnam. The president told us the agreement will be signed on Saturday. American troops to come home within 60 days. It's and overdue, think, long overdue. Yeah. People are tired of it. Uh, they want to get to their homes. They want to get back to the countries, to the farms. I really do. I think it'll last. The Vietnamese people themselves are strong people, and I think they will be able to get themselves together. I think that uh, we're doing the right thing by letting them get a chance. I'm happy for myself, but most of all, I'm happy for, for the POWs. Yeah, right on. That's it. I'm very happy for get the POWs. Not in 60 days. Oh, I think there'll be a peace for a while. Whether they stick with it, that's up to those people. Prophetic words. Within two years, the terrible suffering in Vietnam will appear pointless.